Follow along as I read from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. This is the word that the Lord has for us tonight, and this is the good news that He's giving us on this crisp fall evening. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And the world is to be judged by you. Are, are you incompetent to try s- trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. It's wonderful to be with you uh, this evening, and I'm glad you're here. This is the third time that we've gathered to consider Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. And just as a reminder, we'll be walking through key moments in this letter for most of the coming year through April, and asking a very specific question each time we do. Who is Jesus calling us to be? And you can see that printed on the front of your bulletin. Now, I think that that's a pretty good question. But that's probably not surprising, considering the fact that I came up with it. My challenge to you, though, um, especially tonight, but every night, is to trust that question. To press into it and really use it as a way of guiding your thoughts about the text before us and the words that you'll hear me say about it. That's really the value of all liturgy. That we can use it as a tool to guide and to groom and to ground our worship, and our reflections about God's Word. With regard to this question in particular, though, sensing God's call on your life is more important than any other thing we do in this service. And certainly the most important, significant thing that you do and I do now during this sermon. And hopefully, as we've seen over the last several weeks, these, this letter is clearly oriented towards that same question, and it's yielded some challenging answers already. So we saw that Jesus is calling us to forfeit our pride and to be loyal only to him. That to follow Christ is to live according to the wisdom of the Spirit, as we saw last time. And doing that means subjecting our desire for coherence and for strength, those impulses that make us boast about ourselves, to subject all of that to the lordship of a crucified Messiah and the mystery of this cross. Tonight, I think we'll hear something a little bit more practical, um, that Jesus is calling us to be people who settle conflict peacefully. And I'd like to show you that call in tonight's passage. But before I do, I want to say a preliminary word about the text itself. Paul has in mind here specifically legal conflict. That is, civil disputes having to do with property rights and criminal behavior, actions that are considered illegal by the state. And so before we move on to speak more generally, I should say right off the bat that that's the clearest takeaway from this passage. Um, That's a sermon that you will not hear tonight, but it is a sermon of this passage. Paul's frustrated that the church in Corinth has been airing its dirty laundry for the whole world to see, and Christians are suing other Christians. And that kind of divisive, contentious Behavior is giving the church a bad reputation, or at least a reputation that doesn't comport with the sort of gospel that Paul has been preaching in Corinth. And so he's encouraging the Corinthians to settle those legal disputes internally. And maybe that's where you are this evening, in which case, hear these words loud and clear. Christians shouldn't take other Christians to court. I really don't know how else to read Paul's words here. It's really that simple. He's telling us that the gospel is the basis and the ground for society in the church, not the law of the land. And that means that it it alone, that this gospel should dictate the way that we relate and the way that we reconcile when that society is damaged or jeopardized. 
And yet, I don't believe that's all 1 Corinthians 6 has to, has to say to us. I think there's more that we need to say. In fact, I think um, there's more that might pertain to all of us in the room, regardless of where we stand uh, legally. What Paul says about legal conflict reveals some of his convictions about the way Christians should always treat one another, and more particularly the way that we should go about reconciling with each other when we fall into disagreement. In other words, I think there are theological contours to Paul's reflections about legal disputes, which apply to all conflict between Christians themselves, and as I hope to show you, um, conflict between Christians and non-Christians too. There are at least two of these contours, and that's where I'd like to spend our time tonight. The first is that Christians are capable of handling conflict, and the second is that Christians are responsible for handling conflict. Um, So those might be simple statements, but I think they're incredibly difficult convictions to put into practice. But they're relatively easy to remember. So we're to be capable and we're to be responsible. So we'll start with capable. There are a lot of questions in these verses. And typically, uh, that's a clue for us that Paul's either angry or he's narrowing in on a particular exhortation. And maybe both of those things are true in this, this text. First, he asked the Corinthians if they take each other to court. Or in his words, um, if they go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints. And then he asked, rhetorically, I think, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And further along, do you not know that we are to judge angels? Now, I just said those were rhetorical questions, and yet I'm not sure how we would respond to those things. Maybe we don't know that we're to judge the world, or that we're to judge angels. I think that's a distinct possibility for most of us in the room. So what is Paul talking about here? What does he mean? Well, however we interpret it, I think the truth of James 4 verse 12 takes priority. When it says that there is one lawgiver and judge, and who uh, and one who is able to save and to destroy. In other words, whatever it means for you and I to judge, that role doesn't infringe upon the sole sovereignty of God and the sort of judgment that he dispenses as the Lord of creation and redemption. There are clues in Scripture that give us some idea of what our role uh, might be in that judgment day. In Matthew 19, verse 28, and in the parallel passage in Luke 22, verse 30, Jesus talks about how the disciples will be seated around him on thrones and that they will um, judge the 12 tribes of Israel. In Daniel 7, um, it talks about how God's uh, people um, come into possession of the kingdom, that they are possessing it. Our judgment of the world has to do with our status in the kingdom of God, and the degree to which we share, not in God's authority to condemn or punish necessarily, but in his authority to govern and oversee this redeemed world. It's that governance that I think Paul's talking about here. We share in God's governance over the society of God's kingdom. And somehow that also entails some share in Jesus' lordship over creation, which Paul talks about here as, as, as judging angels. But that judgment itself uh, doesn't seem to be the real point of Paul's argument. Um, it's, it's just an example that he gives us in order to illustrate our capability as disciples to resolve conflict with one another. In other words, he wants the Corinthians to see that they are more than able to settle conflicts with each other now because someday in the future they will help God govern his kingdom on earth. And that begs the question, what gives us this ability? Uh, why and how are we capable of judging What power do we have as as Christians that allows us to judge uh, not only the matters pertaining to this life, as as Paul writes here, but the world and angels? For our purposes tonight, I think the answer to that question is given elsewhere in Paul's correspondence with the church in Corinth. Listen to what he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 20. He says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And now listen to this. All this is from God who brought through, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. 
That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. And, and there's this other clause that Paul adds that the English translators aren't really good at placing. But God making his appeal through us. As if that's what it means to be an ambassador. We implore you, Paul writes, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You and I are capable of handling conflict, according to Paul, because it's a ministry that Jesus himself has entrusted to us. I mentioned earlier that the society of the church, and I mean society quite literally there, as a group of Christians relating socially to one another, like a, um, what is it, a gaggle of geese or something, and a conspiracy of ravens, and a personal favorite, a parliament of rhinos. And that's true, you can Google that. Um, I, I mean quite literally this social group. And the society of the church is built upon the gospel. And that means that the gospel, as I said, and not the law of the land, not the state, should be the standard by which you and I relate to each other and through which you and I work to heal what becomes damaged or broken in that society. We do that because Jesus has given us the gospel to proclaim and to live by. And that's what Paul means when he says that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation there in 2 Corinthians 5. We've been given in this miraculous way, in a way that doesn't really make logical sense, some share in the same spirit that, of God that, that reconciles him to us in spite of our sin. That's what capacitates us. That's what enables us to take part in God's governance of his kingdom. We now function as his ambassadors and even more to the point, we're now able and capable of facilitating reconciliation with each other whenever and however conflict arises. That's the first thing I want us to see tonight, that we are capable of solving conflict. And yet, perhaps that idea implies something maybe even more important and challenging, namely that resolving conflict is possible. You see, if we're capable of reconciliation then logically that reconciliation might, must be an actual possibility. And not only a possibility sometimes, because I don't see any conditions which create exceptions to that rule in Paul's mind. And so reconciliation is always possible. In other words, for Paul, any and every conflict, even those that are serious enough to warrant legitimate legal action, what he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians, all of that, any case, and the church is capable of being resolved because of the ministry that God's entrusted to us in his son. Now there are probably some of us in the room who just heard that and immediately uh, think that I made some mistake. Because reconciliation in itself is obviously, not, is, is obviously somewhat a misplaced priority. Maybe what I've uh, had to say seems well and good, but it's certainly not practical advice. This is not how you and I live our lives. It's not something that we can or maybe even should practice in the, in, in the situations that maybe are in mind to us. Why? Well, because sometimes reconciling certain conflicts costs too much. Maybe compromise feels unacceptable. And that's true a lot of the time, I think. And there's something noble in that idea, isn't there? About being unbending and inflexible about knowing that you did nothing wrong and that it's the other person's responsibility to fix things, not yours. I, I get that. I feel that way all the time. I find myself acting on the premise that being together really isn't the goal of solving conflict so much as being right, which is really just another way of saying that reconciliation isn't my, go my goal in conflict resolution at all. Victory over my opponent is my goal. But the possibility of reconciliation that Paul's outlined here in 1 Corinthians 6 challenges that noble, seemingly noble impulse in us. Paul's saying, maybe being right isn't the goal of resolving conflict after all. Maybe being together is more important. Maybe God has different priorities than you and I. Maybe his ways are higher. Maybe his wisdom is foolishness to us. Maybe it's more important for you and I to show love than it is for you and I to defeat our rivals and condemn our enemies. Sure, there will be times when reconciliation will be excruciating, where in order to resolve our differences with someone, we'll feel like we're giving away everything that we are. And sometimes 
Absolutely, there will be moments when we have to stand in defense of our most personal convictions and, and not budge an inch. And yet, in spite of all of that, in spite of the variety of conflict and the variety of situations that we can come up with, the gospel entrusted to us by the Spirit proclaims that reconciliation is always possible. So in spite of every attempt to get out from under that uncomfortable reality, every attempt to try and find exceptions to the rule, we must finally admit that what Paul is saying here is true. The church is always capable of resolving its disagreements. No matter how difficult it is, settling conflict between believers is always possible. And there's no excuse. There's no escaping our capacity to reconcile here and now. Paul doesn't tell us in verse 3 that there will be some conflicts pertaining to this life that are simply inevitable. Or will only be solved later on. No. No. He's telling, that there's, he's telling us that there's no place for grievances or disputes in this new community called the church. The power of Jesus Christ, which has reconciled the world to himself, has been endowed to us through his spirit. And that means you and I are capable of handling any and everything. There's an edge to this, which is very communal. Um, but don't forget the personal ramifications um, of what we're seeing here. Think of those friendships that have soured. Think of those people that have done you wrong and who you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, will do you wrong again if you offer them a chance. Think of your enemies, those people who violated your deepest trust and your confidence. People who've hurt you and done things that you can't understand and won't ever comprehend. They could be family members. They could be coworkers. They could be friends here at church. Think of that one relationship in your life that seems impossibly broken. Listen, you do not have the authority to pronounce that relationship irredeemable. To condemn it like an abandoned house and forget about your capacity to restore and improve it. You and I don't get to carve out some exception for ourselves in Jesus' command to love our enemies and his commission to go into the world with his power and his ability to reconcile. I think the truest test of our spiritual maturity is whether we can seek peace in our relationships with those people. Paul says that you and I are capable of walking through the hardest of relationships and of seeking and actually achieving and finding peace and reconciliation within them. Not because of some skill in us, but because of the Spirit. So do we believe that? Do we believe God has made us capable reconcilers? Let's move on to our second point. That Christians are responsible for settling conflict peacefully. I'm drawing this idea from what Paul has to say there in verses 6 and 7. But brother goes to law against brother. And that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you, Paul says. The important thing to catch here is the reference to unbelievers. Paul wants the Corinthians to know that the world is watching them. And by extension, that, that the way you and I handle ourselves within the church internally can either help or hinder our testimony to the world external to us. And I think that that fact creates at least two types of responsibility for us as believers. And I want to address them in turn. And the first is simpler than the second, and it's this. The fact that non-Christians are watching us means that you and I are responsible for settling conflicts in order to witness effectively, and unhypocritically. And I technically made up that word, unhypocritically. It's not rocket science, and yet this is really significant for Paul because he'll wind up falling back on this logic again and again as the letter continues. The Corinthians are proud of their freedom from the law. They believe strongly that Christ has come and given them grace instead of judgment. And so sin no longer has any ability to keep them from the Father, which in and of itself is true. And yet slowly, in the intervening years between Paul planting the community in Corinth and now writing this epistle, that delight that the people had in the freedom of Christ has morphed into something entirely different, into an understanding of Christian liberty that's more self-serving and more sinister. In chapter 10, verse 23 Paul quotes the Corinthians as saying, 
all things are lawful. Some of your translations might say all things are permissible. And apparently this was something that the the church in Corinth actually used to say and confess as a church. Paul is quoting them. That because God was no longer going to condemn them for their sins, because they'd become Christians, they could now do anything they wanted under the guise of this unconditional forgiveness and mercy. So how does Paul respond? He tells them all things are lawful, in quotes, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful or permissible, but not all things build up. Notice how he doesn't renege on the freedom of the gospel. He doesn't move an inch when he says that. And he doesn't retract what he said about God's mercy and his grace. But he also doesn't give them a new law to follow. He doesn't say, no, you are obligated to follow the law. Instead, he gives them a new priority. And that priority is other people. He wants the Corinthians to judge their actions and to choose what to do with the freedom they have in Christ by taking stock of how helpful or advantageous those actions might be in relation to other people. And he doesn't just leave it there. He gives the Corinthian church a few specific examples of what doing uh, that and living this way might look like, the most famous of which is eating meat sacrificed to idols. And we'll see this later on. But suffice it to say for now, that it's that same sentiment that's active here in chapter 6. It's that same question of the observer and the prioritizing of the one who's watching you as you make decisions. It's that same idea that comes to dictate Christian behavior here in relation to conflict resolution and reconciliation. We've already seen that we can resolve conflicts, that that's a possibility for us, that we're capable reconcilers. But now we see that we should resolve them. And in fact, we're responsible for solving them because people far from the kingdom of God are seeing if you and I, uh, if, if what you and I have to say about Christ and his ministry of reconciliation actually makes any difference at all. They're watching. It's for their sake, Paul says, the sake of those undecided friends, those agnostics and, and, and neighbors and people all around us that we ought to seek reconciliation with other in the church. And the second way, you and I are responsible for settling conflict is a little more different and more complicated, but it's this. The fact that non-Christians are watching us means that you and I are responsible for settling our conflicts, not just internally, but externally. In other words, the presence of other people looking in and seeing how the church functions and whether or not we actually practice this ministry that Jesus has given us doesn't just mean that we ought to clean up our act within the church. It means we also have to demonstrate that same ministry in our relationships with them. I think this is one more way by implication that this text seems to uh, grow a few degrees from its original historical context. Because as we already noted, it's not just about lawsuits, but about all conflict. And similarly, we now see that it's not just about all conflict in the church, but also conflict that the church has with the world. We're to be reconcilers in all of our relationships with other Christians and with non-Christians alike. Paul knows that the gospel is something that must be tasted in order to be desired. Or to put it in another way, non-Christians must actually come into contact with it if it's to become something personally desirable and admirable and relatable. And that can't happen by window shopping, by just observing Christians in their natural habitat at a distance. And so Christians need to extend that self-same reconciliation we offer each other to the ch- in the church to those outside of our community. Just this past June, uh, my wife and I moved to another apartment down the street, just a little ways, an obnoxiously short distance from our previous destination. Um, for to warrant that much stress. And there were a few other people moving into our building at the same time. At one point, um, as we were finally finishing things up, we walked out of the foyer and saw a guy who was obviously struggling to move all of his uh, belongings into the apartment on his own, and he looked like he really could use some help. And so Bridget and I offered to lend a hand. And there was a mattress and a bike just sort of strewn from the from his van to the door. I mean, it, it was a mess. And so anyone would have done this, or so I thought. And it was an uncomfortably short conversation, as in literally all I said was, hi, I'm Reed, 
this is my wife, Bridget. Can I help you take some of these things inside? Literally only that before he squinted a little. And he turned his head and he looked me in the eyes and said, you're an evangelical Christian, aren't you? And then I had that awkward uh, task of telling him, bingo. I'm actually a professional evangelical Christian. I'm a pastor. You guessed it. Right on. Uh, you, you get the idea. I, I'm not saying that I extended reconciliation to this man who was moving into my apartment. That's not what I mean by the story. All I mean to say is this, that there's something deeply unusual and strange about the life of a Christian. And so often that comes to bear on other people in ways that would surprise you. People who really don't know Jesus don't know his followers either. That's actually the case in a way that I wasn't planning on witnessing to this guy there in the foyer, except he was just blown away that someone cared. And I think that that's especially true in the way that we handle conflict. Offering people peace when they've wronged you, and when they're expecting only retaliation and anger, that doesn't even compute according to the logic of the world. It doesn't make sense. People out of sync with God's kingdom literally don't have access to that. It's, it's not an idea that they can comprehend, that they don't, they don't have access to this power that we have in the Spirit, to the sort of ministry that's got, that God's given to us in Jesus. And that's precisely why it's something I think that the church must model and extend outwards. So let me conclude. Paul finishes this section of his letter with some stern words, saying that the Christians in Corinth wrong and defraud each other. That, that exclamation point there at the end isn't in the original Greek text, but I do think it's helpful because Paul is angry. Paul is passionate. And I think he'd be just as angry with me sometimes. He, he really does see within the church a desire to skirt the capacity and the responsibility given to us in Christ. And that's deeply disturbing for him. This is not okay. But just before that, in verse 7, he asked two important questions. And for our sake tonight, I think they function as a kind of diagnostic tool to see if we've really taken what he's had to say to heart. He asks, why not suffer wrong? And why not rather be defrauded? The translation there is kind of clunky, but the meaning is absolutely profound. He's saying, what if it's better for us to be wronged than to remain in conflict? What if reconciliation with our friends is so important that we should seek it out, even if it means suffering things we shouldn't have to suffer? What if settling conflict peacefully is more important than our right to self-defense? Because peace is more valuable than vindication. Because God wants us to become reconcilers, even in those conflicts where our opponents won't understand it, and will instead likely throw it back in our faces. There is always a cost to reconciliation. Always. Reconciliation with friends who've fallen out with will always cost us something. In fact, it might cost us more than we thought. But the example that we have in our Savior is someone who sought reconciliation with us at great cost even to his life. Never at any point did Jesus step back and reconsider if the cross was worth it. Nowhere in the biblical narrative does God place some limit on the amount of sin he's willing to tolerate in his grace before he can excuse himself from working out our, self, working out our salvation. So if being in relationship with other people means that we must sometimes decide between being defrauded and wronged and just giving it up and living in discord, then following Jesus will always mean at every moment that we prefer and choose suffering unjustly. Suffering anger and ridicule and punishment that we know we don't deserve in order to secure reconciliation and peace. Or to put it another way, because Jesus is who he is, and because he's done what he's done, following him means that we must always choose the way of the cross and prefer the good of being together over the, the security of our own dignity and our well-being, the good of being right the good of having justice. And the way of the cross doesn't mean going halfway. It doesn't mean showing some 
reasonable degree of initiative and thereafter waiting for that friend to do his or her part. No, the example Jesus gives us to follow is literally one in which, one in which we must stop at nothing to achieve peace with our enemies. Christ died for the ungodly. He preached peace to you and I who are far off. And there's no limit to that love. Do we get that? Are we ready to take that up? Is, are we ready to have the Spirit dwelling within us and to, and to have this ministry of reconciliation in which we refuse to count each other's trespasses against other people? Like God refuses to count our trespasses against us. Do we really understand how difficult and counterintuitive and maybe even reckless that is? Reconciliation is worth it. Would you pray with me? Father, this is a truth that's too big for us. And it's too weighty for us to, to deal with on our own. And yet we know this is your call in our lives. And so we ask that you would do what only you can do. That you would work in us. Lord, miraculously. In ways that we might not expect. And that you train us to seek and save those who are lost. Or that you've given us this ministry and that we would go forth from this place and be your ambassadors. Bless that you would do these things in Jesus' name. Amen.